songs. May the Lord bless you. <clears throat> Once my clothes were ragged, the world looked down on me. I had no hope for tomorrow, nor for eternity. Then grace came with mercy and heard this orphan's plea. Now I've been adopted. From bondage I've been set free. Now I'm no longer an orphan. Someone has rescued me. My garments no longer are tattered. My family is royalty. Amen. I'm no orphan, are we? I came so empty-handed, no place to call my home. No one to really love me, but now look what I own. I'm feasting on the manna that comes from God on high. And there is no shortage there is a vast supply now i'm no longer an orphan someone has rescued me my garments no longer are tattered my family is royalty no i'm no longer an orphan someone has rescued me my garments no longer are tattered. My family is royalty. Amen. Amen.
the Lord tonight and all his goodness appreciate the good singing won't be long before you I was asked this morning to continue our teaching out of Hebrews 4 now of course we was in the book of Ruth uh, like we have been in the last two months and we was talking about biblical rest and I didn't jump in you boys way did I <laughs> all right now, I was asked to teach on that because there, it is a deep subject, but yet it's one that is so needful in this hour that we have rest. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter number 4, verses 4 through 11. We looked at verses 1, 2, and 3 when it concerned Canaan rest. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll go back over some of that this tonight, but not much. This is why it said, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth. A certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if thou, uh, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, that he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore remaineth uh, therefore a rest uh, to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works, as God did from His. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. First of all, in verse number 4, let's pull that back up. For He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of His works. The first thing that I want to address is God's creation day or his seventh day of rest. That's what he's speaking of here, of another place. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, let's, let's turn to that. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. 
Now you see there that after the seven day literal uh, day of creation, he rested from his labors. Now the question at hand, did he retire or did he quit working? That's not what he's saying here. He is saying that I have rested. Amen. I have completed the work in which I started before the foundation of the world. Amen. So along comes Adam and Eve. Now let me say this to you tonight. I know there's a lot of preachers. They preach that Adam and Eve was created in a innocence. That's not so. They were created in the very image, amen, of Almighty God. In other words, they were, they were created in a perfect uprightness. There was no sin about them. In fact, Adam had so much of God's righteousness in him that he was not deceived in the fall. He chose it. That's how come the fall was so great. If you don't believe me, go back and, and in the book of Timothy, and he'll tell us that Adam was not deceived. He actually chose that because of the love for his wife. So what we're finding in the creation rest is Adam is resting, amen, in the finished work, amen, of God. There was no need to pray for forgiveness, amen, tonight. There was no sin to be forgiven. There was no need to pray for consolation. Nobody ever had a broken heart. It sounds pretty good to me, don't it, you? There was no need to pray for uh, the release of pain because nobody was in pain. Because they were resting in the finished work, amen, tonight, of the creation rest. Does that make sense? If it does, just shake your hand there a little bit. His creation work had been done, it was perfected, and they were now resting. Now, all of us know that that, didn't, that that didn't pan out. Of course, I'm glad, and let me run a rabbit here. I'm glad it didn't catch God off guard when Adam fell. I'm glad before the very foundation of the world, Jesus had a, lame, a lamb that was slain just for you and I. I get tickled at some of the theologians that said, Oh, God had to search through heaven to find one worthy to die. Lord have mercy, that was settled a long time ago. That was settled before there was, uh, there was ever time was a time or even there was a creation in the world. There was a lamb that was already slain. So, so what took place was that there was a separation. Of course, when sin entered in, they are now no longer operating in the rest of God or in the rest of the original creation. That's why you find them running from God. They are now separated. And now they're trying to find something that might uh, 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 appease God or try to uh, uh, find favor with Him. They were covering up with the fig leaves and the trees, you know, uh, trying to cover their nakedness, trying to cover their shamefulness. The world's still doing it today. Amen. We, 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 the world goes through, if I could just have enough good works, if, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'll be pleasing unto God. And, amen. We go through all of that mess. But here, I'm here to tell you right now, they could not find rest. Amen. Because of sin and something that separated them. And, and from that point on, God began to work again until Jesus Christ came. He began to work on the redemptive plan that was set forth before the foundation of the world. Amen. If you don't believe me, the first thing, amen, that, uh, that, that God did was he slain, amen, an animal. I believe it was a lamb. Amen. He, sl he slew that lamb. Something had to die for sin because that was the promise. If you eat of this fruit, you will die. Amen. Not only did they begin to die physically, they, began, they did die spiritually. Amen. That's why that every man that's born again or born into this world is born in sin and shaping in iniquity. That's why when God saves us, He's got to quicken us because we are dead in trespasses and sin. And whether we realize it or not, man is not only sinful, but they are restless. They're restless. They're running from one thing to the other, trying to find rest. And apart from Christ Jesus, you'll never find rest. So God, I, that's good preaching right there. <laughs> and so from that time on, God has begun His work of redemptive plan. All right? Then secondly, we're looking at the Canaan rest. Verses 5 and 8. And in this place again, 
if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, enter not in because of unbelief. And again, he limits a certain day, saying to David, today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, that he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now this is what he's talking about. He, he's pointing us right back to Genesis or to Hebrews chapter number 1, verses 1 through 3. Talking about Canaanite rest. Amen. Now what was the Canaanite rest? Let's rehearse it a little bit. The Canaanite rest was that they believed the word of God, the promise. The promise that he was going to give them the land of Canaan. A land that was filled with milk and honey. They talked about Mays Jackson this morning. I laughed about it. Somebody said that them grapes were so big that they took all the goody out of it and put it over their head and made a shark help out of it. <laughs> Amen. I, I keep, and let me run a rabbit here. When I see the giants, when I see the opposition that comes, if I keep my eyes on the opposition, it'll overwhelm my heart. But if I keep my eyes on the grapes, woo if I keep my eyes on the blessing, if I keep my eyes on the land that flows with milk and honey, I won't mind the giants. The giants won't bother me. It's just another stepping stone for me to enter into my Canaan land rest. Come on now. You know what's wrong with a lot of Christians today? We lose focus. Charles Spurgeon said that we're so easily distracted from why we're here. Why are we here, church? Let me ask you the question. Why did God save us? To glorify the Son of God. So that this world, when they look at you and I, that they may find some Jesus is on this earth. Hallelujah. We are the hands. Lord, I feel the Holy Spirit all over me. We are the hands and the feet and the mouth and the mind, amen, of the Lord. And if, if this world's going to see any Jesus, they're going to have to see it in us. Come on. And the reason that they did not enter into that Canaan land rest, the promise was already finished. Look at me. God said, you can have the land. It's yours. But why didn't they enter in? Because of their unbelief. Come on. In other words, they say they're born again. They've been delivered from bondage. Amen. But they're no longer in, they can no longer enjoy or they cannot enjoy amen, that land of milk and honey because they have not rested in God's promised word. Are you with me? You can be saved here today on the way to heaven, but you, your life can be like this. Amen. Because you've not entered into that Canaan land rest. You've not believed God's word. You believed everybody else. Everybody else tells you how sorry you are. And you'll be worthless and you'll be a nothing and be a nobody. When are you going to start believing God? When are you going to start understanding that I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir with Christ Jesus? Amen. That, that all that heaven holds is mine. Amen, that I am the benefactor. You are the benefactor. Amen, tonight of the land of, that God has prepared for you and I. That's a little shouting ground right there. Amen. That he has placed me in a heavenly position. Hath raised us up together to sit in heavenly places. I'm no longer of the earthly. I am of the heavenly. Amen. This whole world is not my home, honey. Can I preach? We're so concentrated on this earth, we forgot about what we ought to be praying. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on. If there's no discouragement in heaven, there ought to be no discouragement on the earth. If there's no depression in heaven, there should be no depression on the earth. Come on. Why is that? Because we have thy kingdom come, thy will be done, written in our hearts. Come on. See, I don't have to bow to the pressures of this world like the world does. Why is that? Because thy kingdom has come. Thy will will be done. If it, whoa, whatever you loose on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. 
If you bind it up on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. I'm going to tell you something, it's time you start loosening some things. You ought to look at the devil and say, hey, man, it, this ain't happening in heaven. It ain't going to happen on my earth. I'm preaching right now. Ain't nobody frowning in heaven. There ain't going to be no frowning over my, amen, in my earth. Amen. Satan wants you to take away from your God-given right and ability to enter into that Canaan rest. He wants you to operate on his terms. And he wants to separate you from the truth of the matter. Listen to me. I said it this morning. Canaan land rest is available not only to me. It's just not for the preachers and the pastors and the deacons and amen and, and you know those who are in leadership. I'm telling you, it's available to every born child of God. I won't quote it again. God's will for your life is to be in health and to prosper. He wants you to be blessed. Come on. He wants you to be whole in mind and in spirit. See, I have not received the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. I'm not confused in my mind. I have the mind of Christ. Let me preach just a little bit. People are always talking about, oh, you can't judge me, you can't judge me. Listen, as, as an eternal judge, I can't judge you. I don't have the power. Nobody else does. I can't judge your eternal destination. But I tell you what I can do. I can judge what's right and what's wrong. I can point out and say, that's right and that's right and that's wrong. Amen. Because I have the power. I have the, the mind of Christ. See, you have not. Re See, when I got saved, I took on the divine nature of God. I am now a partaker. Amen. I have God living in me. Woo! And so I'm no longer who I meant. I am now a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And now I have the capacity, amen, to not, to not be. <clears throat> I have now the capacity to think just like God thinks. So we can enter into that rest. Why don't we? Because we don't believe this book. Look up here now. You know what I see that's wrong with this generation of Christians? What is wrong? You're not reading this book. We believe. This is what I hear a lot of times. What do you believe? Well, I believe what the pastor believes. What does a pastor believe? I believe. Well, he believes what the denomination believes. What does the denomination believe? Well, they believe what the conference believes. They don't know what to believe. Listen to me. You can't fight the devil if you don't know what you believe. Everything that Jesus, Jesus gave us an example. Jesus could have blew away Satan. He could have blew on him and sent him right back to hell when he was tempted. Amen. In John chapter 4 or John chapter 3. But he did. He gave me the example of saying, as it is written, man shall not live by read alone by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. They did not enter in because they did not believe the report of Caleb and Joshua. Listen to me. There was one and a half million Israelites that came out of Egypt. Guess how many got to go in? Two. Come on. Why? Because they believed the majority of the word of the Israelites rather than two. I don't know about you, I like Caleb and Joshua's spirit. Do you not know that Caleb was not even of the tribe of Israel at all? He was one of the Gentiles that got in through by faith. But yet he believed God so much that when they said, we can't do it, he ripped his clothes and said, we're more than able to take this mountain. Why is that? Because he's seen how big our God was. As long as you're looking at the giants, you'll never see how big he is. God's more than able to take care of us in this day. Amen. Because they believed the word. They did. Because of their unbelief, they didn't enter in. Then we look at the Christian rest, verse 10. For he that entered is entered into rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Come on now. 
We're talking about our Christian rest. What does it mean? When you and I got saved and we got born again, I didn't come by my works. I didn't try to get, I could not come to God and try to get His favor. Come on. There's still people trying to find or get God to give them favor. If I do this and I do that and do that, then God will love me more. I'm going to tell you something right now. God has loved you with an unseparable love. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. Neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other living creature. Amen. Quit. Just go ahead and mark them all off and say nothing's ever going to separate me from the love of God. I can't get him to love me anymore. He already loves me. I'm, see, that's why he come to die. John 14 tells us, or, or, or John 11 tells us, No greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Yeah, we now are ceasing to try to find favor with God Because of our works. We no longer have entered into our works. Are you with me? Why is that? Because we are trusting in the work of God. Go back to, uh, go to uh, John 5, 17. Look at this. Am I boring you? Now listen to what I'm saying. But Jesus answered that my Father worketh hitherto. Okay, what's he talking about? Seventh day rest. Creation rest. But now he's talking about, and now I work. What's he doing? From the time that he came from the manger, he set his face like a flint towards Calvary. He lived a sinful life. Sinless. Lord, forgive me. He lived a sinless life without beguile. No wrong thought, no wrong motive, uh, no wrong words. He was always perfect. He was holy. In fact, Hebrews tells us about this high priest who was holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than this heaven. You ought to touch three people right now and say, that's my Jesus. <laughs> Amen. That's my Jesus. He was holy and high, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. What did he come to do, church? What did he tell Pontius Pilate? For this cause came I into the world, and for this reason was I born. I didn't come to heal, which he did. I didn't come to even set the captives free far as uh, Israel is concerned. I come to do one thing, and one thing only, and that was to work the work of salvation. And the only way that you and I could ever be saved eternally is because of what Jesus done at Calvary. Amen. What did Jesus do at Calvary? The Bible said he looked up and he said, It is finished. Not just that he was dying. The work that God had given him to do, amen, for salvation, it was done. You can't do anything else to add on to it. In other words, it's complete. Now let me ask you a question. Why do you want to try to add to what God's already done? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta come to church. I gotta read my Bible. Boy, if I don't, boy, I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna, yeah, you will. But that ain't the attitude you ought to have. It's not that I gotta. Oh, I wanna. For all... I want to thank Him for what He has done. I have a desire because I see the greatness. Let me say this. Can I, can I just go just a little bit further? People talk about, I owe God. If you owe God, it's no longer grace. It's an insult to God to say, I owe God. Why is that? Because it was a gift. It would be like me, my grand, or, or, or somebody bringing me a gift and say, well, I'm going to pay you back. Are you getting what I'm saying? A lot of Christians live that life that I've got to pay God back 
for what he's done. He never expects payment back. It was a free gift. By grace, I always say, through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Why, at least any man should boast. Here's the purpose of free grace and salvation. So you and I can't throw our shoulders back and say, Look what I did. Me, look what me and God done. Talk about, come on. I saved by grace, but boy, I'm going to finish this thing by my self-effort work. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to do it myself. Paul asked the Galatians a question. Have you started out in the Spirit, but now you're going to try to finish it in the flesh? There's nobody in the world that'll tell you that's truly been saved that'll never tell you that they've not been saved by grace. They know it was the unmerited favor of God. But this is what they do. They're trying to finish it with their own righteousness. And that's why they're weary and they're tired and they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's why they, when they go through rough times and troubled times, and when you find them in and you find them out, you find them up and you find them down. Because we get tired, weary. We get weary because in ourself, we can't last too long, church. But boy, if I'm resting in what? The finished work of Jesus. Turn to Hebrew, I mean to John chapter 11. See, there is a salvation rest and there is a sanctification rest. First off, pull up verse uh, 11 for me of Hebrews. This sort of goes along with it. Let us therefore labor, therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, verse 10 is telling us of salvation rest. Verse 11 is teaching us sanctification rest. Now, let's, let's, let's put a little peanut butter on the bread here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Now, here in verse 28, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. That's describing a sinner. Every sinner that comes to God is burdened. They're heavy. Amen. That's why he said, Where sin did abound. Grace did much more bound. Sin has abounded on you. It has laid hold on you. You can't, I mean, there, there's an unrest there. Yeah. What was the first thing that came to your mind after you got said, I don't know what it was mine. I felt like a million pounds been lifted off of me. The burden of sin had been taken care of. So we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 11. We're talking about salvation rest. I'll give you rest. I'm going to lift that burden. I'm going to take it, amen, now that you can, you can rest in me. But listen to this. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What's a yoke? A yoke is where we hook up the, the team of mules or the team of oxen and we pull the loads. Amen? Listen, what I'm preaching to you is not that we don't carry loads. We, it's not that we're out of, of, of where we don't have responsibilities. It's not that we don't have troubles. Don't ever let anybody tell you if you're saved, born again, you don't have no troubles. You're going to have troubles. Amen. Amen. In fact, every time I see a child of God get up, I say, welcome to the, welcome to the fight now, baby. Amen. There is troubles. I'm not talking about to make you feel like you're less than, that you'll not have troubles if I'm really. See, that's, I know I'm running a rabbit here. In the old school, this is what they taught us. If you're having troubles... You've done something wrong. Just because you're going through trouble don't mean you're doing something wrong. It might be doing that you're doing something right. Because you gotta go, you're going through the test. See, we'll never go from faith to faith to glory to glory without a test. And you can't graduate from the seventh grade to the eighth grade until you pass the test. Come on. Now. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. What's he doing? Belief. What did I tell you? That they did not enter into the Canaan land rest. Why? Because of unbelief. He said, I want you to learn of me. I want you to take me in. Let me run another rabbit. We have a lot of folks 
that come through their doors whose conscience is so mired because of past events in, that has taken place in their life. Abuses, physical, sexual, they're marred down. But when you come to Christ, He purges that conscience with the blood of Jesus. And through His Word, He transforms that mind. That I no longer am bound by, by the addictions, bound by the past afflictions, the past strongholds. I'm no longer bound by that because now my mind is being transformed to learn of Him. Amen. Now listen to what He said, For I am meek and lowly in heart. Listen to what He said. The same word, And ye shall find rest unto your soul. Go back to Hebrews 11. I'm going to show you something. Hebrews 4, I mean. Verse 11. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. You, you, I thought you said, mm, I thought it was free. I didn't think I had to work. What he was saying was that we have a pure conscience or a consciousness, a conviction of entering into that rest in which God had. In other words, I'm no longer going to try to do it myself. I'm going to give up, surrender to God and His finished work and let what? God sanctify me. Come on. Why is that Philippians once that He has begun a good work in me shall perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Jude tells us who is able to keep me from falling, present me faultless. Amen. Paul said, I know whom I'm believing in, and I am persuaded. Are you with me? Jason Crabb sings a wonderful song, and I just heard it the other day. And he goes through it, it's called, That's What the Blood is For. You know what I'm saying? And he talks about his failures and trying to get it right with God trying to do his best to get on his feet. And then faith jumps up and says, wait a minute, that's what the blood is for. Amen. amen. That's what the blood is for. The blood is there, amen, to get me on my feet. I'm trusting not in me, but in the blood. Every temptation, every addiction, amen, every trouble, every trial, every circumstance, that's what the blood is for. So I enter in. Can I, let me preach just a little bit more and I'm going to close, okay? The old teaching of old talks about crucifying the flesh. You've got to kill the flesh, got to kill the flesh. What you've got to understand is the flesh is already dead. For I'm crucified with Christ. The old man's dead. I'm alive now. That's what baptism is all about. I have died to sin. The old man. Thank God the old man's dead. But now I've been risen to a new life in Christ. Okay? Why is it that I have struggled with my flesh? It's not that we don't battle. If you don't believe me, go to Romans chapter 7. When I would do good, evil is present within me. Things I would do, I do not. And the things that I would not do, I do. <laughs> What do I do with this flesh? Flesh don't know it's dead. It's still trying to act up. What, I gotta, what do I got to do? I got to reckon it dead. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, Reckon yourself therefore dead to sin and alive to God. That means that's a, calcul that's a mathematical situation. He's adding it up. He, he's adding up the old man, and then he begins to add up the new man. And he, he concludes it in Romans chapter 8 by this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Woo <laughs> even though I'm struggling, even though I'm battling, even though I'm doing things that I wouldn't do and things that I would do, I don't do. I'm struggling, but through it all, even there is now no condemnation. Why? Because I'm resting in the arms of God and His finished work.
For the law of spirit of life hath made me free from the law of spirit and death. Two laws at work. As a sinner, the law of spirit and death was working. I couldn't get up. I couldn't please God. I was headed for hell. I was in sin and full of unrest. But all of a sudden, there was a new law that took place. It's called the law of the spirit of life. He quickened me, breathed into me, gave me the divine nature of God. And what I could not do then, I now can do in Christ Jesus. And I find my position and identity completely in the Lord. It's like two laws at work. The law of aerodynamics and the law of gravity. The law of gravity says whatever goes up got to come down. But there is a law that supersedes that law. It's called the law of aerodynamics, which is where we get our airplane. When that plane goes through the air, the, the, the law of gravity says, no, you got to come down, you got to come down. But no, nah, there's something that supersedes it. There is a law that works in us that supersedes the law of sin and death. See, I'm no longer bound by sin anymore. I've been set free. Whom the Son set free, He is free indeed. Let me close. I read a story about an African missionary he was carrying this heavy load struggling to make his destination the old missionary pulled up beside of him and he said would you like to have a ride jumping on the back he said I believe I would yeah man let me get let me get on the back of the truck well he's going down the road about a couple of miles and he looked back and the old African um, uh, man still had the load on his back. Missionary jumped out and said, wait a minute. He said, you can put your load on this truck. The old black man looked at him and he said, well, I didn't know that the truck would hold my, me and my load too. He was still trying to carry it. There's things that you're trying to carry that God said you don't need to be carrying. Listen to me. There's, There's... The unnecessary feeling of guilt. People carrying it around. Why don't you accept what Jesus, the finished work of what Jesus did, who saved me not only from my past sins, my present sins, but my future sins. He has, what did the Bible, is this the promise of God? If a man confess his sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us from what? Some of our unrighteousness? Does that mean just at the present time? No. God looks through the past, the present. What you going to do next week? What you going to do tomorrow? It's already forgiven me. Some of you will walk out of here and you'll go get you a Big Mac and a Diet Coke. And somebody will pull out in front of you and you, you're leaving out of here and rest. And now you're madder than, than if you've been hit through the face with a wet squirrel's tail. Beeping your horn and a hollering and... God died for that too. Can, mark how quickly can we pull up for because I'm not done yet. I don't think I've got what I needed to say yet. First John chapter one, one and nine, and then John chapter two, verses one and two. Or one. Two, one, one and nine. Can you get that for me? Because I want you to get this. First John 1, 9, and then First John 2, 1. I'll read it. <clears throat> now, because I want you to get it. Now, he said, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. But then he begins in chapter 2, verse 1. 
My little children, these things I write and do that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate, a paracletos, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, I want you to get this. In John chapter 1, 9, we're talking about the sinner's confession. This is where I get all my sins forgiven. Past, present, and future. Pull up. Two, one. But now we're going to the saints position My little children God's little children No longer lost No longer going to hell I'm a son of God These things I write unto thee That you sin not God said I don't want you sinning Don't ever believe Because I preach grace I want you to go out there and just Preach you know sin Live it up That ain't what grace is about Yeah, amen. amen. See, the, oh, I'm glad you said that, Tony. <laughs> Help me preach, son. I want you to. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that I ungodly and worldly lust to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You'll not be able to live a good Christian life until you get a hold of the grace of God. Because it teaches me. It doesn't teach me to live like hell. Shall we continue in sin that the grace might abound? God forbid. But this, if I do sin, listen to this. If any man sin, I feel the Holy Spirit. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Look here. Come up here, Bob. I have an adversary called the devil that's constantly. Now, you're not the devil now, Bob. Bob's been a great friend. He's known me a lot. He's put up with me for almost 30 years. I know he's has to be a good and well, 25. Look, I have an advocate, or I have an adversary that when I do sin, he comes to the throne of God, and for the first time he tells the truth on you. Oh Bob Fletcher. You see that thought head went through his head? Oh, Bob Fletcher, you know that little white line? Now, I'm not saying you do. <laughs> that little white line that he told? What are you going to do about it, God? He's telling truth on me. But here I have an advocate. Give me to you. I picked him because he's a big one. <laughs> here's... here's Here's my advocate. Come over here, Bob. Here's my advocate, Jesus. The paracletos. He's more than just a lawyer. Many people use that word just for lawyer, but it's actually the same word of the Holy Spirit, one who comes alongside. When my name comes up to the throne of God in a negative way, I got a Savior that comes alongside. <laughs> Bless His holy name. And he pleads my case. Amen. And he said, I want you to go back to verse number 9. He's confessed his sins. All sins have been forgiven. All unrighteous been past, present, and future. Amen tonight. Now, Father, what are you going to do about it? This is what he does. Case closed. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You can be Case closed. Oh, we'll go there too. In Romans chapter 1, 1 through the middle of the verse, he is declaring the depravity of man. The unholy man, a good moral man, a religious man, and then the Jew itself. And he concludes it like this, for all have sinned. And all have come short of the glory of God. But the next word, but therefore being justified by his freely, by his blood, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How am I redeemed? How am I justified? Is it that I work towards justification? 
If I do uh, good enough that I can get God to justify me, absolutely not. Listen to me, justification is, and I hear people preach this all the time and it's not so. It's that he wipes the slate clean. He don't wipe a slate clean. He breaks the slate. What did he do when we were justified? That's the declaration that God has made. That's what justification means. Justification declares as though I had never sinned. What does he do in my sin? He casts them as far as the east is from the west. Never to bring them up before me. He pushes them into the, into the, into the sea of forgetfulness. He puts them behind his back. He never looks at them ever again. Come on, past, present, and future. So you're wallowed in your, in your guilt when you fail. What you need to do is just come back to the Lord and accept the advocate in which he has already pleaded your case. Come on. You ever seen this? I've been quitting for 20 minutes. I promise I'm quitting. You ever seen this? Somebody get out of church for a while and they do things that they said they'd never do. And let me say this to you. You're not above reproach. You get out of fellowship with God, you'll do the same things you did before you ever got saved. Now, you might not enjoy it. You won't enjoy it as good. But you can do it. You can say things you thought you'd never say. Drink things you thought you'd never drink. Smoke things you thought you'd never smoke. <laughs> I mean, absolutely in a bad shape. Here's what I found out. My advent. When they come back to the church, they trust in the advocate who has made that intercession. They sit back there like, I'm not worthy. Let me say this to you. There's people in the church that make you feel like you ain't worthy. I got a young man right now. Went through, he was pre preaching. I mean, he could preach the horns off of a billy goat. And went through some things. Got back out in the world. And now people are saying, you're not worthy to stand behind the pulpit. But here's the thing. I never was worthy. And you never was worthy. What makes us righteous is our Lord and Savior. It is the covenant that was made, amen, a long time ago at Calvary. Before the foundation of the world, there was a covenant, a council. Acts tells, tells us about the council between God the Father and God the Son. That if Jesus would die for our sins, there was a covenant made that he would save every born or every, every child that would ever come to him. There's where my worth. Listen to me. When I feel like that I'm not worthy, I have to go back to the rock of salvation. The one who made me worthy. And stand in the righteousness of God. Father, Lord, I know I've been long-winded tonight. Lord, I want to thank you for your rest that we have in Christ. I'm no longer trying to please you by my works. But Lord, today I'm trusted in your finished work. Lord, if I die and go to hell, I'm going to die and go to hell believing, believing in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. And I know it's not going to happen. You made the promise. You made the promise. And Lord, today I stand in confidence and reassured, uh, reassurance and security as a born-again child of God. Lord, I'm going to make it. In fact, I'm so thankful today that you said...